All right. Everyone should be blessed by now. Are y'all blessed? Come on. Come on. You can say yeah. You can say I'm blessed. If you're not, you can say no. It's okay. Let's be honest in here, all right? Say like, no, I haven't gotten there yet. Well, hopefully by the end of service, you'll be there. Amen? You know, it's funny. <clears throat> I consistently talk about we, we have this weird kind of disconnection in church with our emotions sometimes. Um, not everybody, but if you've ever dealt with this, uh, I know I have, you know, then, then this is for you. But we, we tend to kind of operate in this, like, in this piety, in this, this uh, dignified way. And when we were at camp, it was interesting because they did the song Undignified by David Crowder Band. It's an old song, if you know it. But it's talking about when King David danced his clothes off, you know. And he was undignified in worship before God. And that's what we're called to. And what's funny is any of us could go to like a Spurs game and be very undignified. You know what I mean? It's because you're not even thinking about what you're doing. You're responding to what's happening before you. You watch a football game and, and someone scores a touchdown or your team has it intercepted or whatnot, and you immediately respond out of your emotions. But for some reason, when we come into church, we think that's not okay when this is the most okay place for that to happen because God wants to touch your heart, mind, and spirit. He wants to touch all of you, and he wants us to respond to him with the fullness of who we are. And so I encourage you today, as we dig into the Word of God, to allow all of you, your intellect, your emotions, and your spirit, man, to hear and to partake of and to interact with what we're going to be talking about today. Amen? Are we online? All right. Thank you for everyone online who's tuning in and watching us today through Facebook. You're welcome. You're here. You're part of our family as well. We just can't hear you clap. You're not loud enough. So, amen. Yeah, you, you feel free to chat and, uh, and say nice things uh, about the, the sermon this morning. I'm going to try my very best to get through this. You know what's fun is to lead worship, to lead worship it with a, a loud and, and awesome song that, you know, we're really feeling, and then after that to come preach because... Um, I'm human, and my voice is, uh, is kind of there still, so pray for me as we preach. Amen? I want you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. The last time I preached, we camped out for a bit in Romans chapter 8. We talked about that we were more than conquerors. Amen? We're going to be continuing that concept of more. The title of today's message is that you are made for more. Say, I'm made for more. Turn to your neighbor and tell them you're made for more. Tell them I made for more than you. No, you're not. Okay. No, we are made for more, and we're going to be uh, examining the Scripture, and uh, I don't know why it's my lot in life, correcting uh, the, some concepts regarding certain passages in the Bible that I think we often look at in the wrong context. And, the, you know, this message was really stirring in me. I was... Uh, kind of by myself most of last week. Uh, they just talked about camp. Our children went to camp, and uh, they, were, they were greatly blessed, uh, but I still had to work. So I went and took them out there, and then I drove back, and Candy stayed out there with Sean. So I was basically by myself for a week and, uh, and had a lot of time to contemplate and pray um, and really spend time in the Word uh, and also work out and, and watch Alfred Hitchcock movies um, and eat steak. You know, let's I'm not just like floating so super spiritual around here. I, 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 you know, had an interesting time without my family. But then when I went out with them, I got to spend time on Saturday at camp uh, with the kids and in uh, service, which was awesome. It's always a blessing to see teenagers and children just all worshiping God and being blessed while they do so. And what's really powerful about this past Saturday when we were there is that it was a children's camp meaning it was the little guys, younger than youth, and in the midst of the worship service, Abby uh, Circles, who's on staff there, she specializes in children's ministry, and she made a comment. This was, this was about two and a half hours, I think, into service, and so many of these kids are at the altar, and they're worshiping God, and they're on their knees, and they're on their faces and everything, and she said, you know, the books will say that you guys shouldn't be doing this. You know, that children don't have the attention span to spend that kind of time in a church service, in worship, without you suddenly seeing, like, kids 
wrestling in the middle of, of, of the sanctuary. But yet here they were doing just what they were doing, worshiping God, praying, praising, listening to the word, being blessed. And it, it's, an, it's a practical application that God is greater than our intellect, greater than our thoughts on things, greater than what the books say should be the attention span of an eight-year-old. Amen? So hopefully your attention span is greater than an eight-year-old today. Amen? Amen. So, um, but I'll tell you what was most powerful. I'd already been, I had already been praying about this message. And we had a moment with Lucas, and I told him I was going to share this. During the week after we'd come back from camp, he was dealing with some sorrow. He was sad to be gone from camp. And I mean, sad to the point where every time my son began to talk to me about it, he started to tear up, or tear up. He started to kind of get choked up and, and kind of fight back those tears. And he said that one of the things that was really powerful for him, one of the things that hit him, and one of the things he was dealing with is that when he was there, he felt that he had a purpose. And then when he came back, he didn't know what it was anymore. Amen? So with that in mind, let's dig into this scripture. Romans chapter 12. We're going to be starting in verse 1 and 2. And this is probably going to be a common scripture, but maybe we've misunderstood it. And you can follow along in your word. We're going to put it up here as well. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This scripture is often mistakenly used to discuss a variety of things, like whether or not someone should get a, a tattoo or uh, used to preach against a particular vice, right? Your body is the temple. It should be a holy sacrifice unto God. It's also put into a context of what it means to be worldly. But again, it's, it's often misunderstood because what Paul's referencing here isn't the physical body as a means to avoid sin or as a sacrifice of atonement, right? Jesus did that. He's using it in context of what a sacrifice is, though, but a living sacrifice, not something that's been killed in order to make atonement. And he's not talking about just your physical body, and so it's not simply what you do outwardly, because what he means is, the, is he's talking about the unit of you, the entirety of who you are, should be a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. That is your reasonable service. This actually harkens back to something Paul uh, wrote about in the sixth chapter of Romans, where this is, this is our duty to God for everything that he has done for us and everything that he does in us. It is our reasonable service to present ourselves, all that we are, to God as this living sacrifice for his purpose, and he's not talking about being transformed like the world in the context of sin, that, like what we usually think about it, because worldliness is not about your attire or your music or your clothing or anything else. And that is how this, this passage of Scripture has often been taught. Don't be worldly. But what does that actually mean? We often think of worldliness as, well, someone who you know, commits a lot of sin and dresses kind of weird and, and doesn't conform to what we think of in the church as Christian behavior, Christian attire. Maybe they don't wear khakis and a polo shirt, and that's, that's worldly. Or they listen to loud music with a lot of drums in it and loud guitars. Maybe that's worldly. There are churches that will tell you that if you have a beat on two and four, it's demonic, Okay, 
but most of our worship had beats on two and four this morning, and God moved mightily. So, so we have to understand in the context of what Paul is saying, what he is talking about, not in our modern context. We take what Paul is saying and we translate it into our 21st century and we make it mean something it doesn't mean. But we can understand what it really means if we understand it in the context of what he's saying. If we only read verse 1 and 2, like I always say, context is kind of important, then you miss the point of what he's saying. Because when Paul wrote this, it was a letter. It didn't have chapter titles. It didn't have verse titles. It didn't have verses at all. It was a letter. And the entirety of the letter has a point to it, like we saw in chapter 8 when we were studying it a few weeks ago. So he says a little bit further down, starting verse 3, For I say, this is Romans 12, 3, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all of the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Anyone ever heard this passage preached on its own? You've heard verse 1 and 2 preached on its own. You've heard this preached on its own, and they're all part of the same chapter, is my point, okay? Verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Paul is writing about the calling that we all have and our place where we are to serve. The thing that God has made you for and called you to accomplish without prejudice and ambition. The opposite of that is what it means to be worldly. To live like the world is not to offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. Instead, we hold ourselves back, often following a God along the path based upon our comfort, willing to serve as long as it fits our budget, desire, and schedule. But God is calling us to more. If we will listen to what Paul's saying, and we will listen to the voice of God in our lives, it is then that we can be fulfilled. What he is saying is that worldliness is not a specific sin. Paul's not calling people out based upon a number of things. But what he is defining it is to say to not be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the word of God. Amen? Do you understand? Not to be conformed. What is to be conformed? You know, if you've ever worked with a piece of metal and you're trying to get it to shape a certain way, you put it around something that's shaped like what you want. You ever watch a metal worker like on Discovery Channel or something, and they begin to move the metal back and forth over some bent piece, right? Because they're getting it to conform to their will, getting it to conform to that predetermined shape, getting it to conform to what they want it to be. And that's what happens so often in our lives as Christians. We begin to conform to the will of the world, conform to what the world would have us to be. We so easily fall into this temptation of following our calling with God or not following our calling with God based upon our own prejudices and ambition. And when I say prejudice, I'm not talking about even outward prejudice. I'm talking about the prejudice you have for yourself, for good or bad. Paul even warns us in this letter, in this epistle, he's telling the Romans, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Understand who you are in faith, who you really are. Some of us don't think highly enough of ourselves is the truth. Some of us don't think that we can accomplish the will, purpose, and plan of God in our lives because we don't think we're good enough to do it. And in some way, you're right. You're not good enough to do it. God's chosen you because he wants to do it through you. Amen? And we're all good enough for that. But the other danger is that we can think that we are definitely good enough to do it. We... we, we, we are way better than what people are telling us to do. 
I'm better. I deserve to do something better than that, right? Like, that's beneath me. I need to do something else. And what Paul is saying is that you have a purpose. You have a position. You have unique strengths, talents, and abilities that God has blessed you and possessed you with for a specific task. And that you need to understand what that task is so that through faith you can accomplish it as a living sacrifice to God. And it can be a sacrifice because what we have to do then is we have to put aside the things that we, out of our selfishness, want for ourselves and submit ourselves to God and all that he's called us to do. And I can guarantee for most of us, I can tell you for a lot of times in my life, I fall into the trap of doing less than what I'm created to do. Why? Because I'm not doing what I was created to do under the leading of God. Because sometimes you, you, the truth is, it's really difficult to know yourself. If it wasn't, Paul wouldn't be warning us about this. To know who you are, to be comfortable in your own skin, to know who you are, most importantly, in Christ. And then, in understanding that, who you are and what you're called to do to actually accomplish that despite all of your hang-ups. Whether your own prejudice against yourself, your situation, or your ambition to greater things. That's what the world would call us to. Are y'all hearing me this morning? Candy brought up that next week we're going out under the bridge. And last time, I was really blessed to go and to serve the homeless. But can I be honest with you guys? I didn't want to go. Can we be real? I didn't want to go. I, was t- I think, if I recall correctly, I'd even preached that day. I didn't want to go. I did not want to preach, be exhausted, and then not have lunch or, you know, have like a little thing that we picked up on the way. I think my wife actually brought me food, if I recall. So I had a brisket sandwich or something. And then drive and stand out in the summer in the heat under an overpass and serve a bunch of people food. I didn't want to do it. But I did it. Come on. Sometimes God's calling you to do stuff you don't want to do. In your flesh, you don't want to do it. It's a sacrifice. How can we read things in the Bible where it's asking us to pick up our cross daily, to walk after him, to be a living sacrifice, and yet if it's outside of our comfort, it's like, hey, you know what? I, I know they need help, but listen, it's like 170 degrees outside, okay? And I have a condition where I don't like to sweat. And I have this soreness that happens every time I actually, like, use my limbs. And so, you know, I'll pray for you guys at home in my air conditioning, and that is what I'm called to do. We need to actually be willing to do what is uncomfortable because that is what God is calling us to do, to be stretched, to move in faith toward the tasks that he has for us, that you are uniquely positioned and made to do. He says in here, if you are called to prophecy, prophesy. Ministry, minister. Teach, teach. If you're going to exhort, do so in exhortation. Give. If you're called to be a giver, give liberally. Amen? Lead. Then lead with diligence. Show mercy, then do so with cheerfulness. To do these things that you are called to do, to accomplish them in your life for the life of others. Amen? So everybody's going to be there next week, right? Look, if you can't be there, I'm not going to guilt you into being there. But if you can be there, then you ought to be there. You should go and serve. Many hands make a light load. I always say that, and it's very, very true. If you want to see God move in your life, 
Put yourself in a position to see God move in your life. Do you know where God won't move? Where there's no need for him to. Or where there's nobody faithful and willing enough to be used by him. And I'm preaching to myself here. Amen? I don't, I don't often want to go to camp. When I have to chaperone at camp, it basically means I'm going to be sleeping on a very uncomfortable bunk around a bunch of very smelly young men who don't like to shower, and it's hot, and I'm going to be eating some carb-tastic food. It's not exactly on my diet, and I'm going to be tired because I'm going to have to get up early. I'm going to go to bed late. But there's purpose in it, and if all I'm doing If all I'm doing is driving them there and supervising them while they are blessed and touched by God, then I'll do my part. Amen? So the question that we have before us is, do we want to live like the church, like the church is designed to be, or do we want to continue to allow ourselves to be conformed into the picture of the world? Because the world, it, it, it's a selfish place. It's self-seeking. It's protective. It's I got mine, and I'm going to get more of it. And I'm not going to risk that for something that doesn't give me gain. And we're called to live sacrificially, to give, and to give some more, and to give some more. And the thing about it is that when you find your purpose, it sustains you. It will sustain you because no matter how tired I am when I go to those things, once I'm doing them, I'm blessed. Once I make the effort to do it, I'm blessed. You know, I liken it to when I started working out. Well, and you know what, even now, okay, I don't always want to work out. I do not often want to get up in the morning and grab my gym bag or go out in my garage in 170 degree temperatures, you know, and start lifting weights and running on a treadmill. I don't want to do that. And, you know, 100 pounds ago, 300 pound me definitely didn't want to do that. But what I found is that when I made myself do it, get up in the morning, grogging, I don't want to do this, and grab my bag anyway, and drive to the gym, then I always felt better afterwards. I always felt better afterwards. Because I had accomplished what I set out to do. And a little life hack for you guys who work out. If you take your pre-workout, then you're kind of committed to doing it. So all you got to do is have enough energy to stumble into the kitchen and drink some pre-workout and then go, well, now I have to go work out. So that was free. But I'll tell you another, another person who encourages me. So Lucas, that was powerful to sit at the table and, and see my son kind of choke up with this realization that he had a purpose at camp and that he's not sure what his purpose is anymore. That's the power of purpose. That's the power of knowing what you are supposed to do. But he also said something along the lines of he was having an intimate time with God, and he wanted that to continue, and he realized that when he left that place, he left that bubble, we call it, and was suddenly back at home, back in his routine, back doing what he had been doing, suddenly he realized that that desire wasn't the same. It was still kind of there, but it had lessened. Listen, if an 11-year-old kid can get this, then I'm praying that you can get this this morning. Because what happens so often when we encounter God is that we usually do so because we've changed something. God's calling us to change, to go after him with more fervor, to seek him greater, to press through the crowd like the woman with the issue of blood and just reach for him. And when we do that, we encounter him. And then what happens so often is we go, well, I'm here now, and then I'll just go back about doing what I was doing before. That's crazy. We need to have this recognition that the reason that our lives, our our relationship with God deepened is because we desired it and we sought it out. And all you got to do is take like half a step, he'll take 15 toward you. But when they come back from camp, and I talked to the youth about this on Wednesday, if you go back to doing what you were doing, then you're going to get what you got. There's three things I told them. It's important that we all hear this. When you're at camp, you're in a different atmosphere. You can't walk down the volleyball courts at that place without hearing praise and worship music. It's everywhere. 
You're in an atmosphere that is primed for the preparation of your spirit. It's not manufacturing something. It's creating the atmosphere for something. Amen? And then you're in a place where they do a really good job of setting your expectation. You walk in and they are telling you from the get-go that God is here and he wants to meet with you and powerful things can happen if you will allow him to. That's the expectation. And then you are doing things different than what you did. For all the youth, they're not playing Fortnite all day long. Yes. I'm starting to hate that video game. Half of our Facebook people just tuned out. He doesn't like Fortnite. Click. They're doing something different. They're getting up earlier. They're having devotion time. They're serving, you know? And so things happen that are different. And when they come back, they're no longer in that bubble. And so I told them on Wednesday, I said, you know what you have to do? You have to create your own atmosphere. You can do that. I've done it my entire uh, walk with God. Sometimes I just need to go to a place, even, even married with children, right? I'll just go to my own place. I'll put on headphones if I have to. I'll put on worship music. I'll close my eyes. I'll tune out, and I'll get with God because I'm creating my own atmosphere. And you know what you have to do? You have to create your own expectation. The Bible even says so, that you have to encourage yourself in the Lord. This is expect a miracle church. God's not going to just go, yeah, this is happening. Be excited. You have to create that expectation because you will do, follow me, your actions will follow your expectation. Your actions will follow your expectation. In every matter that you do, guess what? If you expect bad traffic on the way to work in the morning, you have to be there a particular time, guess what you do? Guess what you do? You leave earlier, right? You start looking for different routes, right? Because your actions are determined by your expectation. Your actions and your walk with God are going to be based upon your expectation of what you know he's going to accomplish through you. If you are called to something, if you have heard that from God, then you will modify your behavior and actions to follow that expectation. Amen? Now, here is the public service announcement, the disclaimer for this message today. This is not Pastor Chris telling you to quit your job. Amen? This message is not, oh, I'm called to ministry. I better go quit my job right now. In fact, if we reread what Paul wrote, we need to utilize our gifts and blossom where we are planted. You, <laughs> I'm going to say that again. You need to utilize your gifts and blossom right where you are. Right where you are. Your gifts are in you regardless of where you are. I'm going to say these a few times because I need, you need to write this down. Somebody should be like tweeting these. Your gifts are in you regardless of where you are. Your ability to serve God is not defined by your profession. Your ability to serve God is not defined by your geographic location. You're called to be a missionary? Great. America needs some missionaries. You shouldn't become a missionary once you get to some other country. Our pastor told me a long time ago that she believed that people that were called to certain offices began to operate in those offices long before they were in those offices. You know what I mean? Someone who's called to pastor is going to be pastoring. Listen, if you're called to pastor, are you pastoring at work? Are you discipling people in your life now? Do you notice that when he said, if you're called to prophesy, become a prophet? He didn't say that, did he? He didn't say that. He said, if you're, going, if you're called to prophesy, prophecy, then prophesy. He said, if you're, if you're called to lead, lead. If, if God's given you apostolic gifts to lead people for the sake of the kingdom, but you're not leading at work, you're not leading in your family? What are we, this is what Pastor Randall said this morning, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Amen? I think the thing for many of us is that you simply have to realize who you are. You have to understand who God made you to be. I heard this great example. I was listening to Francis Chan, 
And he shared this, and I'm, so I'm going to share it. I'm giving him credit. Of course, he credited to a pastor in, in South America. And I've actually thought about this after he said it. I was, I was like, oh, yeah, I had that same thought. This, uh, this pastor's church was growing, and uh, they were having lunch, and he said, you know, well, it's great work. You guys are, are really growing. And the pastor kind of said, yeah, but it's still a zoo. The church is still a zoo. And Francis said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, have you ever seen the movie Madagascar? And Francis Chan goes, well, of course. Yeah, it's, don't all Christians watch Madagascar? That was a joke. Everyone's like, yeah, all Christians watch Madagascar. He said, you know how in Madagascar, you've got these animals all in the zoo, but you've got the zebra who like runs on a treadmill looking at the jungle. And he's turning 11 years old. He's about halfway through his life. And he has this realization that he's made for something more than what he's living. That running on a treadmill looking at a picture of the zoo was not what he was created to do. And he tries sharing this with his friends, the hippopotamus and the lion and the giraffe, and they're like, what are you talking about? This place is great. You know, we've got sun. We've got everything we need. They come and they feed us. The lion's like, I get up and I roar and everyone cheers. And then they bring me steak. I would love a life like that. Get up, raw steak, yes. <laughs> and so they can't understand what his problem is. Thankfully, he, his problem is taken care of by a bunch of penguins, you know, because that's usually how life goes. But the point of it is that when they get there to the, the wild, suddenly they all start to get a recognition of what they are. Now, not at first. Not at first, right? They kind of struggle, and, and they're freaking out. And they're like, what do we do? And the zebra's like, what do you mean, what do we do? This is what you're made to do. This is what you're made to do. If you will just simply trust your instincts, you will figure out pretty quickly what you're made to do. And I love it because as the movie progresses, and they're running, and the zebra's running, and the lion's running, and suddenly the lion starts eating the zebra. Because he's doing what he was made to do. <laughs> Backfired for the zebra a little bit. But. but how often is it that we come to church and we are like that lion or the zebra running on a treadmill looking at a picture of jungle being fed? Amen? We come and we sit and we're fed. And that's not what the church is supposed to be. We're supposed to come together and congregate to be encouraged as iron sharpens iron and then go out from this place and do what God's called us to do. When we look at the situation of, the, uh, of our country, of the world, I, I read a lot of statistics and I see what happens repeatedly that church attendance is declining, that belief in the younger generations is declining, belief in any faith is declining. And it's going to continue to do that if all we do is come in and roar and get steak and go home. And we're satisfied with that. And I'm not satisfied with that. And I hope you're not satisfied with that. We learn who we are when we come to Christ and we listen. Our Apostle Don, our late Apostle Don, would consistently say that you have to listen to the minutest details of his voice. That whisper. And I, I had this moment last night. You know what we're really bad about as, as a society is quiet. We're really bad about it. We don't like silence. Think about it. If you're in conversation with someone, we call it an awkward silence. Do you ever catch that? It's an awkward silence. The silence itself isn't awkward the way we feel about it is. You can't be in a conversation with someone, looking them in the eye, both of y'all stop talking without one of you start feeling weird. Because that's how our society is. There, other societies aren't really like that. Our society is really, really bad about that. Because we... We crave this input and this constant communication. But we're, if, if the silence, if someone stops talking, what do you do? 
you start talking, right? It's like, oh, they haven't said anything. I guess I'll carry the conversation. And what happens too often in our times with God is that we're just carrying the conversation. We're just talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. Our prayer just becomes this repetition of talking and talking and talking and talking. And you have to be quiet and you have to be still in order to hear the minutest details of God's voice, to really hear what he's trying to speak to your heart. Last night, I was in the kitchen getting my wife a glass of water, which is my duty every night as she goes to bed, along with a bunch of other stuff. And uh, see, I know what I'm supposed to be doing, y'all. Uh, I have purpose. And that purpose is turning on fans and turning off lights and letting dogs in and getting water and so forth. So I was standing in our kitchen. I let our dogs in and I turned off lights. And I was standing right in front of our refrigerator. And I'd gotten her some ice and put it in the glass. And as I'm standing there, I, I, in the silence, I hear a noise. And I think about, what is that for a minute? And then I look up, and about 12 feet above my head is an AC register making this really, really, really quiet noise that I could only hear because nobody else was talking, and the TV wasn't on, and everyone was asleep, and the dogs were gone. Are you, are you following me here? When the noise had ceased, I could hear things I couldn't hear before. And then I poured water into her glass, and you know what I heard? The ice crack. When was the last time you heard ice crack? Right? Why? Because there's noise everywhere. There's noise everywhere. We have filled our lives with chaos and busyness to the point that we can't hear the voice of God telling us what to do. And on those off chance times that we do, we are so caught up in our schedule and our routine that we often fail to follow what he's leading us to do. But we have been called to be living sacrifices, to reject what true worldliness is, to not be conformed, to be transformed for his sake. If we go back to the end of verse 2, all of this is so that you can find what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God of God. And so I am exhorting you today to understand what you are called to do and to allow God to stretch you to do it. Amen? Right where you are, begin to do it. To begin to serve in the capacity of what he has created you to be. Because you are truly made for more than what you are accomplishing right now. I believe that. I believe that of you. I believe that of me. I believe we are called to more. Amen? Amen. I want to invite you guys to stand to your feet as I pray for you today. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that what we have read and understood today would be meaningful to us and that it would move on from being just knowledge to becoming revelation. That we would begin to understand what each and every one of us has been created to do for your kingdom's sake. Lord, I pray for everyone here today, everyone watching online, I pray for myself that over the coming weeks and months that you would help us to quiet our minds that you would help us to escape from the noise of this life so that we can fully hear 
what your purpose and plan is for us so that we can hear those minute details of your voice that whisper in the wilderness. Lord, by the measure of faith that you've given us, it is our desire to present ourselves as living sacrifices for your purpose, for your plan, to be conformed to not the world's plan, but to your plan, to be transformed by your word into the people that you have meant us to be from the dawn of time so that we can know what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will. Lord, I believe it is our earnest desire to see you move in our lives and through us in the lives of others. We want to see miracles. We want to see salvations. We want to see deliverance. We want it, Lord. Have your way in us to accomplish that. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to share earlier and I forgot to. We shared during prayer today. On Wednesday, we had a wonderful time in the Lord. And, uh, and Pastor Randall felt led to invite anyone who needed prayer for a headache to come up and, and to, to receive prayer. And Lucas came up. And he, Randall didn't know this, but Lucas has been dealing with headaches on a daily basis for weeks. And Lucas told me the other day, he said, I haven't had a single headache since Wednesday. He hasn't had a single one. And that so blessed me because I'm so tired of the, like, having this false expectation of, of not truly believing. I, I've, I've even said it before. I, I identify with that scripture where it says, I believe, help my unbelief. I want to see God truly move. I'm, I'm, so, I'm no longer satisfied with, oh, we prayed for you. How's your headache? Oh, it's a little bit better on a scale of 1 to 10. Oh, it's a 4. Okay. Or it's an 8. Oh, that's... Well, we'll just keep praying. I want more. Amen? And so I'm so encouraged that we... <laughs> Randall, there wasn't any more than that, right? You prayed. It wasn't like, more Lord, keep praying. I mean, sometimes that's okay to press on and to, to have persistence in, in believing for healing and miracles and salvations and stuff. That's okay. There, there's precedence for that in the Word of God. Jesus prayed for the, the blind man. What do you see now? Oh, I kind of see shapes. Well, let's pray again. That's okay. But I want to eventually see that full miracle take place. And all the better when all we can do is, Lord, I pray that you heal him and see the power of God take place. Amen? That's what, that's my heart. That's my heart. I want to see that happen. Does anyone else want to see that happen? To talk to people in your life that you know aren't saved, that you have an earnest desire, that you want to see salvation in their lives, not just for eternity, but even for their life here upon this earth, that you want to see them live a fulfilled life, and you're so frustrated that you haven't seen it happen. To finally see God move. To see them come to the knowledge of God. I'm just so sick of not seeing God move more powerfully in the lives of people around me. And so I'm ready to believe for more. Are you ready to believe for more? Amen. Do you want to share something? One of the things that the Lord had spoken to me while I was at camp was was just basically what he was just saying is wanting to have more, wanting to see more. My heart has been I want to see God do more with our kids, with our children. I want to see them to have that encounter with the Lord. And when I was at camp, it's been many, many years since I had actually gone and and they have a time for leaders and pastors that are there attending camp to come and pray with the children or pray with the youth. And I hadn't done it for many, many, many years. I just didn't feel 
I just didn't feel like I needed to, or there was the times I was going through the low places in my life where I just didn't feel I could. But camp this year, I felt like the Lord said, go. And the thing that said in my head that the Lord just dropped into my mind was, lead by example. And that is key for all of us. If those are those things that you want to see happen in your life or happening in your children's life, you must lead by example. Because I can go tell my children all day long, and we could tell the children back in the, in the children's church all day long, read your Bible, pray, and you'll have an encounter with the Lord. But they're not seeing the parents or their leaders doing that. And if they don't see it, they're not going to follow. Because ultimately, like with Lucas, he doesn't, I do my Bible study and prayer at night when everybody's in bed because it's quiet in the house. So my children don't see that time. But now it's been even a conviction to us, wow, Lord, what, what made me encourage me to continue to doing what I'm doing? Well, it's those memories that I had of walking into the living room and seeing my father on the couch with his Bible wide open. And I knew as soon as I walked in, I was like, oh, daddy's with Jesus. So I better not disturb him. But it's that lead by example, those things that you want to see in your home, in your workplace, lead by example. Show those who you're trying to reach out to by doing those things, not just talk about it, but do it. Because when I was up at that prayer line, okay, mommy's talking now. I looked up and I'm praying for children. These children have serious problems. I'm like, this should be a adult stuff, but these are small children. Serious problem. One of them came and said, can you pray for my baby sister who's got cerebral palsy? That's hard as a child. Or to pray for my, for me, I'm having nightmares. I can't sleep at night, and I want peaceful sleep for once. These are serious problems, so I'm praying with these children, and I'm realizing this is not about me anymore. <laughs> This is about them. But I look up and I look directly down the line because I was just directly across. And who do I see praying for the little boys? Lucas. And right then and there, I about broke because those words of lead by example. My child saw me do it and then he was directly across from me doing the same thing. You want to see the breakthrough and happen in your homes and in your family? Lead by example. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell on my wife here real quick because she's actually a really good example of what happens when you have purpose. Um, she's a night owl, and she also likes to sleep in. And uh, if we're around our house and, and, I, and I or the children are present, um, she has no qualms whatsoever asking us to do something for her. Even if it's like, get the remote that's exactly three feet away from me because I don't want to get up and do it. And like, I was in another room. Okay? But, all that being said, when she has purpose, there is nothing that will stop this woman. And it, sometimes it's kind of annoying. And, and I don't care if it's, uh, if it's youth, if it's women's ministry, children's ministry, or when we went down uh, after Hurricane Harvey in the Port Aransas area to help out. She was getting us, John can attest, she's like a slave driver. So we're like exhausted. We, we're, we have no blood left because the mosquitoes have sucked it dry. And she's like, there's another house. And we're like, what? And then we go to another house. She's like, and there's another house. And we're like, for real? And she's like, come on. Because that's, that's what purpose does. A, a, a woman who won't get up in the morning for anything will suddenly get up with no problem whatsoever if it's to accomplish something that she knows God has called her to do. Amen? It's awesome. Yeah, I don't wake her up. I let God do it. So that's what purpose is. So I'm believing that God's going to show you your purpose. He's activated you today in that purpose. And we're going to see it come to pass. Amen? Amen. I'm going to...